This is One on One. We're pleased to welcome our good friend Ken Kirsten, former editor, New York Observer. He's so much more than that. He is someone who understands politics, media, and um, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Steve. Ken, by the way, to describe for those who don't have a sense of the New York Observer, its place in the media landscape in this region. Well, I probably have an outsized view of its place and importance, but uh, the Observer is famous for punching above its weight. You know, it was founded about 30 years ago um, to sort of be... They often described it when uh, the Wall Street banker, Arthur Carter, who founded it as the uh, college newspaper of the Upper East Side. Mm. Um, but it, it grew way beyond that. And while the five years I was editor, it actually grew to a national publication. Right. And uh, because our uh, publisher and owner at the time was the son-in-law of this guy running for president. Um, Jared it, Kushner. It, yeah, that's exactly right. It, its influence and uh, uh, intrigue were uh, beyond anything they had experienced prior to that. You know, I told Ken right before we started the program that we, we always disclose when we're taping. We're taping during the holidays in uh, 2017. That so many things happening and changing around us every minute. Forget about every day. Quick description of Jared as a person. Jared was, a, a, I'll, I'll, just, I'll give you a description of Jared Kushner as a publisher first, all right? Um, he never got the credit he deserved, in my opinion, for, for what an excellent publisher he is. And as you're seeing now, the, the media experienced this like unprecedented wave of, of breakdowns where it's it's under constant assault of being fake news on the one hand, and on the other hand, there, there really is these, you know, these evidences of, of extreme uh, bias and misbehavior and, and all kinds of bad contact. I just felt that, that Jared uh, paid a lot of money to run this thing almost always let us do what we thought was best. And when, you know, when he had an opinion, he, he lobbed it in there, mm. sometimes forcefully, but, but never was heavy handed. And even the, the people who worked for him, the editors, uh, my predecessors uh, who, who weren't uh, personal friends with, with him as I have been, um, you know, they, they, they can attack his politics, they can, they can attack mm. his, um, you know, the fact that he's serving in the government now, but they, they really haven't been able to lay a glove on him as far as uh, integrity goes. So, so, so let, let's, I'm always fascinated by your thoughts on bigger picture questions like the relationship between the media, not a monolithic entity, including those of us in public broadcast, uh, and the president in this White House as we do this program. This whole fake news thing that you just put out there right now, which the president talks about a lot, you believe in that there is a consistent pattern of so-called fake news, which some of us often believe is those of us who raise questions challenge the White House as we would anyone. Would you, you actually think there's this thing called fake news across the board? Absolutely. I believe, that the, I believe that the mainstream media has such a, a profound and pervasive hatred, and I use that word advisedly. Strong it's, word. it's an emotional reaction to this president to the point where they, they believe uh, as a whole that something went wrong during the 2016 election and the, the smart people didn't get the candidate that, that they thought was supposed to win. That, that they believe that it's their job um, as, as citizens and as uh, smart people and, and better people than the people who, who voted for this candidate to, to sort of correct this, this mistake. Ken, excuse me, move, move beyond the campaign and talk about the governing process. To what degree do you feel that President Trump contributes to the adversarial, unhealthy adversarial relationship with the media by calling people out by name, by actually calling them names by saying what is put out is fake news, and in fact, disrespecting the media and telling his audience publicly they are the enemy. Do you think that that's presidential in any way? Or you're a student of leadership, and one of my favorite books of all time is the book you wrote with Rudy Giuliani on leadership. Is that leadership? President Trump is definitely pours gasoline on the fire. There's no okay. doubt about it. He's an, incendiary, it he's an incendiary person. Whether it's helped or not, I, I do think he's played a role in exposing something that was sort of bubbling beneath the surface and, and corrosive to a democracy, which is that the, the media thinks that its opinions and its, its uh, viewpoints are more important and more valid than those of the average uh, citizen. They, they, by and large, do not cover the news objectively. They cover it with an injection of how they think the world ought to look. And that, that might be fine if those viewpoints were, were more diverse and uh, ideologically diverse than they are. But a staggering number of these people, many of whom I love and hire, and you're my Facebook friend, you see them yep. comment all the time on my Facebook, 
but a staggering number of them agree with, with each other on everything. It's, it's stunning to me how uniform the opinion of these uh, so-called nonconformists is. But take out the question, the, the, the opinion part, because some of us are not opinion journalists, and if we are, ex in fact, expressing our opinion, we do it as analysts or commentators, but in public broadcasting, it's not my place to, and you know that. We've been together a long time. We talked about this. But just the raising of the questions, the challenging of information put out by the White House, you see that as adversarial in an unhealthy way. I'm, I'm fascinated by that because in my interpretation of the Constitution is that that's exactly our role. Do you distinguish that from opinion media? So I, I'll, I'll give you a good example. And this sure. may be obsolete by the time this broadcast, but uh, just a week ago when Brian Ross got on ABC, ABC News. Literally right across it, the street it, from um, us. I'm looking at it as I talk to you. It's over your, your right shoulder. That's here. right. Um, Brian Ross got on and said that as a candidate, President Trump ordered General Flynn uh, to make contact with Russia. Not it's true. Incredibly incendiary charge. It took them five hours to correct it. They didn't correct it till late on a Friday night. And then when they finally did, they blamed Brian Ross rather than uh, fixing the, the system. But what I'm telling you, Steve, is that the reason a mistake like that gets on is not because mistakes happen, as they always have they throughout do. media. It's not that. It's because of this presupposition that somehow this election was couldn't be explained through any means other than, well, it had to be a foreign entity. It had to be a foreign power. So even as we've gone through you know, a year now of examining this and, and uh, Robert Mueller starting to, mm. to uh, get indictments and starting to put... Uh, and we don't know how things are going to play yeah, out. We have so no right. idea by the time this airs. But for a year, none of this has anything to do with the campaign colluding with Russia. All of that has been a year of, of you know, w running on a treadmill. So what, 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 let me make this point, that where I think that sure. that's bad for democracy, whether you like Trump and support him or whether you hate Not him. Not even the issue for a lot all, of us. All of these other issues, he's appointing a record number of judges, record numbers of regulation are falling by the wayside. But you are All these actions his. going on. I, I do support Trump. Uh, the no, president, not just support him. him. From, forget about the politics. As a leader, you believe Trump, President Trump, excuse me, has strong leadership qualities, including, dare I use the term, emotional intelligence combined with maturity. You believe that? I think President Trump has been way underestimated as a communicator um, and as a as an agent of change. And those are two important qualities. There are some Including some Twitter? elements. There are some elements of his leadership that I, I don't think are, uh, That's not are your where style, they should Ken. be. I don't think that he's a perfect leader, um, but I think he's a strong leader. Um, and I, I think he's a way underestimated leader. And that, that has been the secret to his appeal the whole time. When he was a, in a field of 17 candidates. No doubt as a candidate. Um, he was, he benefited constantly from being underestimated. Real quick, but on the governing side, the use of Twitter. And again, it's not even about this tweet or that tweet, because we'll date ourselves. But the use of Twitter and the way he uses it as president, not as a candidate, you don't see in any way as a leadership problem in terms of focusing on what's important versus creating unnecessary fights, arguments, yeah, well, how diversions. How it was like when, when Barack Obama signed up for Twitter and sent his first tweet, it was cause for great celebration of, uh, of the, the great young leader embracing this new technology. Sure. And here's Donald Trump, who has mastered the format, who's, who's way you older than, than Obama, mastered the format, absolutely. That's, that's beyond a, a doubt. Whether he uses it to, to someone's liking is, is arguable. But you can't deny the influence he's had. The use of uh, it. The, the use of it. it. Why is that such a problem? I, I don't get it. He communicates directly as a way to get around the, the filters, the, the, you know, the TV hosts. Without trying to predict, sorry for interrupting again, without trying to predict how things are going to play out, and I'm not, we're not going to do the Russia thing or anything else, I, we don't know. The relationship between the White House and, I'm not going to say the press corps, but all of us in the media, what, if anything, do you believe could or should happen, needs to happen to improve that relationship, if anything? Yeah, that, that relationship is really badly damaged, and I, I think it, it, some of the personal feuds that, that have uh, erupted um, between not just the president but different spokespeople, um, I, I don't think they're helpful to advancing the democracy. And I, th I do think the president shares some of the, the blame there. I, I don't understand the need to personalize um, these fights. But uh, I think the media has, has consistently underestimated this president, has consistently uh, tried to undermine him to the detriment of this country, mm -hmm. and has gotten things wrong way more than they should have because of their view that he doesn't know what he's doing. Final question, the future for Ken Kirsten is? <laughs> You've been talking about spending some more time with your family, which is, as a Facebook friend, I see that, and it's absolutely beautiful. Anything else you're thinking about 
professionally? Well, my, my big obsession right now is, is cryptocurrency and the way the blockchain in, in particular is go, just going to change everything. I, I think it's going to come to redefine money and even uh, what, what being a nation means. So I'm spending a lot of my time uh, focused on cryptocurrency and helping businesses understand the blockchain. You know what, thank you. Thanks As so always, much, my friend. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Be right back right after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Investors Bank, Seton Hall University, PSENG, Hackensack Meridian Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.